Welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD, the podcast that delves into the diverse and impactful roles scientists can play beyond the lab. With me, David Mendez. Today, I have the great, great pleasure of having with me Jonathan Adler. Jonathan is a professor of psychology at Olin College of Engineering and a senior lecturer at Harvard Medical School. He also serves as editor of Personality and Social Psychology Review. Jonathan's research focuses on the relationship between the stories we tell about our lives and our well-being. It has been featured in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, National Public Radio, and many other outlets. In addition, Jonathan is a theater director and playwright. His play, co-authored with Jim Petosa, Reverse Transcription, premiered off-Broadway in July 2022 at the Atlantic Theater Company Stage 2, produced by PTP NYC. He lives outside Boston with his husband, their two young children, and an elderly rescue dog. Welcome to Beyond the Thesis with Papa VHC, Jonathan. Thank you so much for having me. So just before I ask you to tell a little bit more about yourself, my PhD is in cell biology. So reverse transcription, you know, is something that elicits a lot of thoughts for me. Is it related somehow? Yeah. Oh, I'm so delighted you asked. I didn't know we were going to get to talk theater at all. So the play um, juxtaposed the AIDS pandemic in the end of the late 80s and early 90s with COVID. Um, and so we liked the metaphor of reverse transcription, both at sort of the cellular level of these viruses, but also in the sort of metaphoric sense of reverse looking backward and writing down, transcribing the stories. Um, so we're really trying to elevate those stories from the AIDS you know, crisis in the 80s and 90s and trying to seek out parallels uh, to COVID. I'm super happy that I asked the question because this I, we hadn't talked about it until now. Yes, I talked to an immunology colleague who got me way down in the weeds with <laughs> viral transcription. Um, and it was, yeah, it was great. There's so many, I mean, I learned so much of the science and the ways in which the HIV virus and the COVID virus are and are not the same. Um, but also there's just so many rich metaphors in the, in the biological literature. The double entendre is super, super interesting. But one thing is true is that uh, DNA, RNA, transcription, etc., came much more to the fore with COVID and is much more common knowledge now than it was when, you know, in the, during the HIV crisis. And indeed, the, the decades of searching for an HIV vaccine really set us up to be able, even though that those have been unsuccessful so far, partially because HIV um, mutates so quickly compared to COVID. Um, but it, that all those decades of research really set us up to be able to do the COVID vaccine so quickly. Yeah, anyway, I'm happy I asked the question. Now, <laughs> so theater, research, can you tell us a little bit more about you, you know, who Jonathan Adler is? How come he's in theater and in research, in psychology, how, how that all came to happen? Sure. I'll say a word about the mechanics of it, and then I'll say more about the motivation behind it. I mean, the mechanics of it are that I have a very unusual academic job, right? We're talking to graduate students, um, some of whom are will be looking towards academia and some beyond, but I have a very unusual academic job. I work at a wonderful place called Olin College of Engineering, which is a small undergraduate-only college outside of Boston. We're part of a consortium with Wellesley College, which is liberal arts, and Babson College, which is a business school. Um, and so students and faculty trade around the course I'm teaching this semester, um, crosses the colleges. Um, but because I am in the small number of non-engineers at this engineering school, um, but I'm not the psych department, right? So we have Wellesley psych department down the street, which means if students want psych 101, they go down the street. Um, so that means that my job, both from sort of a, I, really from a teaching perspective, is to be broad and integrative and interdisciplinary. And it also means that in the sort of, uh, one thing that's wonderful about Olin is that we don't have the traditional three buckets of research, teaching and service that many institutions do. Instead, our model of faculty activity is a Venn diagram. Um, it is a three circle Venn diagram, but they are called uh, external impact, which includes research, but a lot more than research. So having an off-Broadway play certainly counts in the external impact domain. Um, developing students, which of course includes teaching, but includes a lot more than teaching. So advising, mentoring, running a research lab, those kinds of things. 
Um, and then our third is called Building and Sustaining the College, which does include things like serving on committees, which I do, but it also includes other things like I, uh, using my theater director hat, designed our president's inaugural ceremony to be sort of immersive theater. Um, and so that was building and sustaining the college. So to, the mechanics of my ability to do my research and edit a scientific journal and write plays and direct plays is enabled entirely because of the unusual academic setup that I have. The motivation for it though is actually all the same, um, which is that I've always been interested in stories and how important stories are to us as individuals and as cultures. Um, and that has really driven my interest both in the science of stories and also really in sort of the applied practice of stories in our lives, both in the theater, um, but I also work really closely with a nonprofit organization called Health Story Collaborative, where we work with medical patients to help them tell the story of their experiences with illness and healing. Okay. Okay. Wow. Okay. So it comes from behind. So it's uh, it has to do with your why in life. Uh, and then you actually found uh, uh, how? an ecosystem where you could, you can actually be a professor and do all these things with all these hats. It's different yes. Hats. And I feel... Incredibly lucky when I was on the academic job market, I had I was mostly looking at small liberal arts colleges. I had come from a small liberal arts college undergraduate as myself at my own. Um, and when I so I had a couple of offers and I sat down with my graduate mentor and I said, I'm kind of thinking of taking this Olin job. And he said, there are no other academic jobs in the country like that. So if you think you want that one, you should take that one because it will never come around again. <laughs> um, and he said very smartly, you know, keep doing your research so that you are legible. If you decide after a few years that it is not the right place for you, you need to be able to move somewhere else. And 15 years later, I'm still here. Oh, well, well that, that sounds like sound mentorship. Uh, and maybe it's something we can talk about later uh, in the interview because mentorship is something that's very elusive to a lot of people. And that I always like to broach when, when someone has good stories to share about it, because um, I feel a lot of people are kind of, or feel like, or are like mentor orphans in a way throughout their graduate school. Yeah. Uh, and the ones who aren't, who, who have a good mentor, the story they retell about going through grad school is always, there's always something positive or more positive than someone who feels like they went through it alone uh, and uh, anyway uh, I'm, i'm veering off a little bit but maybe it's something we can talk later um talk about later now uh, as i mentioned i uh, first heard your voice on hidden brain and your story and about your research and about about what interests you in this question of what's the role of uh, thinking about your story your life narrative your you know, professional narrative, whatever, and how it's not, you know, it's something that's not set in stone, although we sometimes think it is. And it was on this episode of, of Hidden Brain. And um, the first story that you tell actually in that, in that uh, episode is about you, about something that happened to you when you were in college. Uh, you went into this project, big project, life-changing project. Uh, you have to move countries for this project. There's a set time. You think you ha you project uh, what's what you're going to get out of this project. Uh, and I'm I'm not revealing any of this. I'm just saying it like this to let you then tell the story. But it also also to make a parallel with people who, like me, change countries to come do a PhD uh, and and have this objective in mind. And then life happens, and things don't happen exactly how you had planned them. Can you share a little bit about that that I just teased? Sure. I, I really like drawing the parallel there and the ways in which you've taken stripped the content out in a way to demonstrate, oh, look, the, the, the arc of these stories could potentially be very much the same, whatever the content. Yeah, for me, the project was really sort of figuring out my sexual identity. Um, I, you know, I was in college. I were, was very invested in my intellectual pursuits and had a wonderful intellectual experience for a whole variety of reasons. I 
had not sort of figured out my own sexuality. I was starting to think, oh, you know, maybe I'm gay and I need to figure this out. I was coming up on my third year of college, which is a time when many students at the small liberal arts college I went to study abroad. And I thought, oh, there's an opportunity. There's an opportunity for me to step completely away from my life, try living in a, the world in a different way for six months, and then I'll come back. Um, and so I looked around at various programs and for a variety of reasons, I chose a program in Perth, Australia at the University of Western Australia, which is geographically about as far away from where I was in the Northeast United States as you could possibly get. And I went there sort of thinking, okay, I'm going to figure this part of my life out. And um, one of my strategies for doing that was auditioning for the theater department's play. I had done a lot of theater. Um, I mostly by that time was doing directing instead of acting, but you can't just show up and ask to direct a play. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll act in a play. I'm a very anxious actor. Um, and much to my incredible surprise, I got cast in the lead in the play. Um, and that experience was actually completely overwhelming to me. Like I said, I was a very anxious actor and I, it was a very strange play, a wonderful play, but a very strange play with a very atypical dialogue. And I had a lot of lines and a lot to do as an actor. And it just completely swamped me. I felt like I'm going to be on stage in front of hundreds of people. I don't want to look terrible so I, I really spent a lot of time working on that and it just sapped me of the energy to do almost anything else. So I ended up feeling like much of my abroad experience was quite lonely. And when I came back to college for my final year, it, it felt like a failure in a certain way. Like I had gone with this intentionality and then not been able to work on the thing that I worked on and sort of I came back no better than I had been. I hadn't figured out anything. So I just sort of put my head down and threw myself into my studies. And I did very well in college. And again, it was a incredibly nourishing intellectual experience. But my personal life was kind of on hold. So at, at that moment, when you come back, uh, you say it feels like a failure. Uh, and my experience of, of these feelings of failure is when you're in the moment, it feels very final. That's right. Uh, I had a, I had this one chance, and I missed it. Right. That's but right. But then you said you you know you focused on your studies, the the that personal work that you kind of wanted to have this uh, test tube where you could do it. You you still had to do it now in a different way, in a different time frame, etc. Uh, in in not in this kind of safe far away space where you had uh, <laughs> you had envisioned. Um, but time passes and and you can start and when time passes you can look back to months before years before it's etc when did this story that may many have been you know you may have been heavy hearted uh, about it for a while when did that kind of start uh, uh changing and and kind of you know sublimating and maybe you you started thinking about it in a different way Yeah, so I took two years in between college and graduate school to do additional research, which is something many people need to do to be able to get into PhD programs. Um, and again, since I went to a small college, even though I had a wonderful intellectual experience, I didn't have a ton of research experience. Um, so I knew I needed a couple of years of research experience. So I started to date and explore um, and come out to my friends and my family um, during that period of time. Um, but it felt very transitory. I sort of knew this was an in-between chapter um, that, you know, college was over, that I was going to do this work for a couple of years and then go to graduate school. And I didn't know where I was going to go to graduate school. So whatever I did in those two years felt, yeah, transitory, temporary, um, like practice. So getting into graduate school coincided with meeting my Now, husband, um, we were just, it's been 22 years since we met. Um, and those two moments happened almost at the same time. <laughs> That's amazing. Now, I'm just going to just look back at what we just said about this this story. You, you build kind of a, a narrative. You pre-build a narrative in your head of something that you project is going to happen. Life happens differently. And this, is, this happens to all of us. And um, in my experience, uh, and with, let's 
stay with, with graduate students or, or young researchers or, or people who graduate and then leave academia, uh, often they go through this experience of, well, these five, six years of PhD and ended up not being exactly what I envisioned. I'm not a professor, either because I can't access a position or because during the journey, I understood that it wasn't actually something that I could see myself doing professionally for a long time. And what I get from a lot of people is that they kind of free, they froze these moments in time and they keep the negative emotion of failure of that time, either when they defended and they, they, they now felt, okay, I am now outside of this community and I may have just, uh, just, uh, spent five years for naught. And from your work, it feels like this is something that's easy. It's an error or it's a pattern that it's easy to fall into, but there are ways to, to change that, to uh, transmute something that may feel very negative in our narrative, in our story, into something positive. The sort of foundational concept that I think it's important for people to understand before we move on is this idea of narrative identity. So the idea is that when we think about identity, the best way to operationalize that variable is as a story. And it's a particular kind of story. It is a story that weaves together our past as we reconstruct it, our present as we perceive it, and our future as we imagine it. So it is this integrative story that unfolds over time. And so, yes, at any given moment, we're in the present and we're looking back and looking ahead from this current vantage point and we narrate our lives to serve psychological functions in the present moment. Uh, we think about the sort of two overarching functions of narrative identity being unity. So you feel like you are the same person across time um, and purpose that your st our stories tell us why we do the things that we do. Um, but indeed those stories evolve. And what's important is that we have two roles to play with respect to these stories. We are the main character in our story. And most of what we do most of the time is go through our day being our main character, right? I had lunch and I walked the dog and then I sat down to talk with you. Um, and so that's being the main character. But we are also the narrator of our stories. And that gives us an opportunity to step out of the flow of our lives and think about the story that we've been telling. And what the research literature on narrative identity shows over and over again is that the way we tell our story, the thematic variation in the way we tell our story is powerfully associated with our psychological well-being. Um, and there's, of course, a correspondence between the themes that we use in telling our life story and the things that really happened to us. But they are ultimately narrative choices that we make. So I'll give you a little example that helps interpret this shift in my own life story. So there's a pair of themes for which there's a, just a ton of research um, that get called redemption and contamination. So in redemption stories, things that start bad and good, and in contamination stories, things that start good and bad. Now, all lives have good and bad in them. So redemption and contamination are really about where you draw connections between events or where you parse the chapter breaks of your life. So if you look at the story we've just told from my life as an example, if you cut it when I get back to college from study abroad, it looks like a contamination, right? I had this grand plan. I go, I get the lead in the play. And then it turns out actually getting the lead in the play swamped my other goals. It all turns terrible. Um, but if you pan back and you cut to a few years later where I'm in graduate school, I'm in a new relationship and very much in love, it looks like this negative experience of college not being what I had wanted on the social side, this negative study abroad experience. That all is the setup for a new chapter that begins with graduate school that is both intellectually fulfilling and personally fulfilling. Um, so neither one of those stories is true in a sort of objective sense. Um, that's not how stories work. Stories are not about objective truth. They are about the subjective meaning that we ascribe to our objective experiences. And that subjective meaning is fluid and elastic, um, depending on how we interpret the relationship between different experiences. 
Mm-hmm. It's a it's a super interesting tool actually to to be able to use in uh, making sense of of something that happened, making sense of where you are today. Now, w- one of the things that I feel affects people in terms of their narrative is twofold. It's the stories other people tell about you or that you think they do and what you think people are thinking of your story are they putting you as a a protagonist or as a you know a second line character or as a villain and i believe because there's you know uh, when you're in graduate school you're in this situation of precarity you may be more inclined to be influenced or to take face value things that come from outside And I wonder whether there are habits or there are ways to kind of safeguard yourself against uh, against this that you that you might uh, reflect upon and might share. I think it's important to introduce another concept from the scientific literature that I think helps illuminate exactly what you're talking about. So the concept are, is called master narratives. So we live in a narrative ecology, right? There are stories all around us in our culture stories that are told about us even before we are born. Um, And indeed, as children, we are born without words, let alone stories. So this is a skill that we have to learn how to do. Narratives exist in the social environment. And some of the narratives in the social environment are incredibly powerful. Those are the ones we call master narratives. Master narratives are often invisible, but they're also ubiquitous um, and they're powerful. Um, And so I think you know, our own personal stories are always a negotiation between the stories that we tell about ourselves and the stories that others tell about us, and also the stories that exist in our broader cultural cultural context. And certainly graduate school, PhD programs have powerful master narratives around what's expected of you, what success on the other side means. And I think many of us enter into PhD programs because we agree with the master narrative, we're excited by the master narrative, um, and we're sort of willing to do that. And I also think part of the graduate school master narrative is that you must suffer, right? That, that That's part of it. Um, and so, you know, when we get back to mentorship, I'd be happy to talk about my own mentor who did not have a narrative of graduate school that it needs to involve suffering, But one of my closest friends in graduate school who was in a different lab, definitely the master narrative of that lab was, this is supposed to be miserable. That's the misery is your evidence that you're actually doing something important. So this is true in graduate school or elsewhere. We're always wrestling with the negotiation between our own stories and the master narratives. And often the master narratives themselves are very seductive, that we're drawn towards context in our lives because we see ourselves or want to see ourselves in the dominant storylines there. Um, But there are real consequences to violating master narratives. Um, And so when one does not live up to the master narrative of what success in a PhD program looks like, there are consequences, real social consequences, but also psychological consequences. One of them that I hear a lot is, uh, especially for you know people who end up leaving uh, leaving academia after their degree, is this loss of identity. So the the w- the typical story is I worked all these years to become uh, to be in science and then to become a professor, and now I'm not a professor. Now I I don't know what I am because the narratives of people I'm talking with in 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 uh, non academic environments are completely different from what I'm used to, and I, I don't even have the language to engage with them in a, in a productive way right away. Uh, and and there's this, yeah, I don't, I, I don't want to misuse the term because you're the specialist here, but kind of an existential crisis after, after getting your degree. I think that's absolutely, if we think about identity as a story, and there's one story about what it means to be doing this PhD, as soon as you stop corresponding to the expected main character in that kind of storyline, who are you anymore? You're right. You don't fit in the story that you've been telling. I, I do think, I mean, this is something that needs to change at the broad culture, the level of broad cultural narratives around what are PhD programs for? Are they just about producing the next generation of faculty members 
or are they about producing, you know, not just scientists, but, you know, people with a, an advanced and specialized knowledge base that could be used in all kinds of domains, um, right? That, that would lead to really different kinds of experiences. My graduate program was a clinical psychology PhD. Um, so that there were two narratives there. There was the faculty track, and then there was the therapist track. The therapist track was unequivocally a failure narrative, right? It's like, oh, that person became a therapist. That's not what this was for. Um, and that's terrible. The world needs therapists now more than ever. Um, and highly trained, specialized, smart therapists is a great thing for the world. So I'm not saying that all faculty in my program espouse that narrative, but in the sort of competitive academic clinical psych PhD programs, that is the master narrative. Well, and and in the, the narrative that I remember coming out of graduate school was, well, not going for a postdoc was failure or and it's not something that is said word for word it's ubiquitous and invisible yeah yeah exactly yeah. and one way that i try to share uh, with graduate students uh, that they should have a booklet of alternate narratives for their outcome after graduating is marvel and the multiverse they should entertain even for fun this possibility of, okay, in this universe, I want to be a professor, but in this in universe B, what could I be? This is a difficult conversation for me to have with these people because first there's this cognitive dissonance of, well, I just got into a PhD program and you're talking me, to me about something non-academic. Right, right. But uh, what, what's your reflection on this? Maybe on this metaphor of multiverses and, and how working on narratives is not trying to be fake because that's another worry that comes with uh, with this conversation is i you know uh, it, it sounds like it sounds contrived this whole exercise i mean so right i'm just trying to trans so marvel works because there's the comic world i was going to say it's also like a choose your own adventure book do you remember those from childhood where it's like if you want to do this jump to page whatever um so i think i have two things about it one is i think that's incredibly sound advice and i'm super th sympathetic to the student who's like entertain multiple life narratives? Like, what are you talking about? That's actually hard to maintain multiple life narratives. That's a burden. And so what, what I actually think is, this is an intervention that needs to happen at the cultural level, not the individual level, right? Like so many change, cultural changes, it's easy to say, you, the afflicted person, need to do X, Y, and Z to have a better experience. And would that help them have a better experience? I'm sure it would but there's also some burden associated with it. But if we could change the culture where it's welcome to our university, you know, doctoral programs where we see many paths for you, like along with your graduate training, you are required to take a course in envisioning multiple paths post PhD. That seems like the institutional or the structural level change that shifts the master narrative that says, oh, actually your job as a first year, second year PhD student is to maintain multiple narrative options for yourself. And yeah, by the end, you might wanna specialize more because the truth is those different narratives are going to prescribe different kinds of behaviors, right? If you wanna land the most prestigious academic job, you gotta do a certain kind of work during the year of graduate school. If you're gonna go in a different direction, you probably need to do different kinds of work. Or I was looking, at small colleges, I knew I was going to need to get some training to be a teacher, which is not part of many graduate programs. The university where I was for graduate school had a graduate student teaching certificate program, and my graduate mentor was incredibly supportive. And I know there would have been mentors in my department who would have been like, that is a waste of your time, do your research. So I actually think it's, you know, whenever we look to individual level solutions, there's some burden placed onto the people who are already carrying a heavy burden, that the structural intervention would be better. Yeah. Well, one, one thing it makes me, uh, that, you know, the one idea that comes to me when you say that is because master narratives are difficult to change because they're often arcane. They come from a long time ago. They're well, well set. And there are people in power invested in them, right? As soon as you topple them, then the power structures of society shift with them. shift. That's it. So people have real incentives to maintain them. To maintain them. There you go. So 
it feels like we as a community would need to find a, a, <laughs> a PR or a marketing agency and rebrand <laughs> the rebrand the graduate school experience and get programs and get universities proud of having their graduates in government, in the industry, as well as in academia. That's right. And and work at this small engineer undergraduate only engineering college. And we it's very small, so we have a very high touch process to recruiting the undergraduates and to faculty, but I was thinking about the undergraduates. So the candidates who make the final cut come to campus for you know interviews and experiences on campus. And they when they get interviewed by faculty, we are very explicitly instructed by the admissions office not to ask the question, why do you want to be an engineer? But to ask the question, why do you want an engineering education? Um, and one of my best students I ever worked with, I didn't meet her when she was a candidate, but when she first came, I met her her first semester of college, she said, oh, I know I don't want to be an engineer. I would like to be the managing director of a professional opera company. But I know that learning to think like an engineer will distinguish me in that industry, and that's going to be incredibly useful to me. And she is well on her way at this point, having graduated many years ago. That's amazing. So this feels to me like she already had the manuscript for her book. Right. And that, <laughs> for her. It was an incredibly precocious young person on along so many axes. Um, but yes, not everybody's like that. So if if that doesn't come instinctually to us, if that's not in our you know makeup, you know, psychological makeup in our genes, let's say, to stay <laughs> close to biology, what are ways for us to take ownership of our narrative a little bit more and not be just buffeted left and right by what graduate school brings us because once you get into that roller coaster it's it's hard to it's hard to to take to, to turn or to stop or to get off the <laughs> get off the ride i think that this particular frame of thinking actually is in and of itself is fairly empowering. So to alert people to two things. One is that they are not only the main character in their life story, but also the narrator, and that their life story is embedded within multiple master narratives, right? So there are master narratives of gender and race, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that they, when whenever you choose to enter a new cultural context, which graduate school is, you are embedding yourself within existing master narratives. And to go in with some awareness um, that that is exactly what you are doing allows you to have a little bit of detachment and to say, I'm going to go into this and be fed a particular narrative about what's important and what matters. My job as the main character and the narrator of my own life is to figure out what matters to me and how I can leverage this experience towards that end. And again, it's like you said, it's incredibly seductive to get pulled into the master narrative or whatever cultural context you're in. That's It's easy. If your identity and the master narrative align, then you have no friction. Um, and so also, I do think people with the experience of being minoritized along any axis often are quite good at this playing the game and having an awareness that they are playing a game. Um, I do think that's one of the benefits of the minority experience is all the time you exist in a culture that doesn't completely reflect back to you who you are. And so then when you enter a new culture, it's easy to have some skepticism, some productive detachment, even if you're still invested in pursuing the things that the master narrative suggests that you ought to. So I think for for everyone, it's the the I do think the awareness is sort of like a crucial tool in resisting the downsides to the to the pull of the master narrative mm -hmm. yeah it, it does make a lot of sense and uh, and you said it you know you, I, i don't think it needs more explaining or more or you're very clear in how you shared it and uh i'll make sure to make it clear in the show notes because i i do think it's it's the basis of the system it's simple is simple the thing the thing that's often a challenge is um getting people you know getting people turned on to these ideas early enough and because often like people are coming from abroad 
they already feel that oh i i have embarked in this wonderful adventure this wonderful master narrative and i kind of can foresee the 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 result although we know that, that you know how that goes reality is always the, you know the map is not the territory <laughs> um but uh, i'm thinking of people i'm thinking about people who uh for whom it may be that they are uh, the first generation in their family to to get this degree there's that aspect too that to them it maybe even makes that master narrative more enticing um the people coming from abroad from places where maybe um relationship to authority is very different than let's say here in north america and that have a that just that puts them in a frame of mind of obedience and uh and uh, and following and and not uh rocking the boat uh and but in a, in a way because we're, you're talking in terms of protagonist or main character and narrator uh it, it may also be there may also be an obstacle for people coming from a background where seeing yourself as the main character just that is already a blo it's something that is seen negatively that's true and and i you know a lot of the work on narrative identity has been conducted in western contexts um mm -hmm. with a sort of western individualistic notion of self um and so i think that's i think that's right that this may not translate to all international contexts where people coming, even if they're coming to the West to do their graduate work, might come with very different configurations of self and expectations for interpersonal relationships. And again, since the research hasn't been done sufficiently in those contexts, I don't know whether this metaphor is as productive for those folks and their well-being, right? Um, I just, there just aren't the data to, to speak to it. I think too, you know, you said the part of the challenge is getting them early. I think about the the sheer number of books out there for new parents, like what to expect when you're expecting and right, like just the number of super popular books about like, oh, you're about to become a parent. Here's what you need to know. Um, and right, wouldn't it be great if there was some really, I mean, it's never going to be a bestseller if it's for <laughs> intern PhD students, but right, some elegant book that was like, Here's what you need to know about graduate school. That was not just the graduate school equivalent of like, what color is my infant's poop? Um, but right, but like, because even those parenting books tell you like what to do, like how many times a day to change the diaper, but they don't tell you how to navigate your new identity as a parent. This is right. Someone could use the handbook for like, what do I do to be successful in graduate school? I'm sure that exists but also how do I navigate the identity piece of what it means to be a graduate student? No, it's a, well, maybe it's an idea. Uh, maybe it's an idea for, for me to think about. Yeah. Yeah. That would be great. <laughs> um, now uh, I, I wonder, uh, cause so we went through your story. We, we talked about the basis of uh, the narrative identity. Uh, we talked about the very important piece of thinking or finding moments where you can, Maybe it's also that that's also the, the 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 next aspect to it is getting people to include in their routine these moments of now I'm sitting in the narrator chair for thirty minutes a week and then um, four do you have a week thirty who has thirty minutes a week to do anything that's good for them I would say it doesn't have to be a week right it's almost like an annual review right like what have I done in the last year. How is it advancing me towards the things that matter to me? What are alternative ways? I mean, sure, if you could do it 30 minutes a week, good for you, but probably you need to be doing your research. Um, so, and maybe once a year is not the right frequency because that's too infrequent to really, if you need to really change course. But, but key milestones, yeah. Key yeah, milestones. a couple of, yeah, maybe once a semester or something. Um, at the end of the semester, okay, what did I do this semester that advanced me towards my goals in a, in a sort of strategic and me mechanical way, but also like, where's my identity at with respect to this project that I'm doing? Is that still working for me? Do I, you know, let me look back over last semester's report and let me see where I'm headed next. And would you say it's because here again, you're, you're doing kind of this looking back. Is it useful to also have a, a part of that time allocated to where can I project myself in two years or in, in yeah five years? yeah I think again if we think about narrative identity as weaving together the reconstructed past perceived present and imagined future I think you want to do all three of those 
you know, what have I done? Where am I now? Where am I headed? Now, something we just brushed really uh, quickly before we started the conversation was mentorship. You talked about someone, about a mentor of yours, and I was like, wow, that was good mentoring. Um, and I feel that if someone, you know, besides getting in tuned into this idea of narrative identity, having, you know, if, if the person can find someone to accompany them along the way, it can be, you know, priceless in terms of how it can help them uh, fine tune their story, maybe see chapters that they didn't see. Can you touch upon that aspect of mentorship? Uh, how how mentorship happened with you for you? Maybe how it's happening today? Sure. So I'll, I'll start at the sort of abstract intellectual first, and then I'm happy to talk about my own experience. I think again. So we talked about our own identity being in a negotiation with other people, with the master narratives. So we need those co-narrators of our lives. Um, and we can find those in friends and colleagues and family members. The thing that's especially potent about a mentor is that they're powerful co-narrators, right? This is someone who has already succeeded at the thing that you're trying to do that has some wisdom about that. And so their opinion sort of carries more weight than your friend or your romantic partner, um, even than like fellow graduate students, because they haven't even, you know, I guess slightly more advanced graduate students might be excellent mentors and have some more power. But yes, if you can find a, a really respected one. So yeah, I mean, I feel just incredibly fortunate to have landed with my graduate mentor who was not only doing the intellectual work that I was most interested in, but also was just authentically interested in helping his graduate students navigate into career paths that were the right fit for them, not just carrying on his name as the next faculty member at a top university doing the exact same research. It's interesting in my little subfield of narrative psych, we often talk about the fact that there are so few of us at big research universities with graduate students. A lot of us are drawn towards small colleges um, and there's a resonance between the content of the work that we do, which is slow, mixed methods, but involves a, involves a lot of qualitative interviewing and really close attention to the transcripts. Um, and people who are interested in the slow nurturing work of shaping undergraduates um, versus being at the graduate level where you're responsible, you're teaching hundreds of people in the classroom, you're responsible for a big lab, Right, it's it's less of a personal relationship with each person, um, but that's not good for our field. So my graduate mentor has been a wonderful nurturer of my own path and many other people's paths. And I don't, I could imagine a very traditional academic saying like, "Yeah, but he doesn't have proteges at every top university." So ha is that really working for him? There's a mess of narrative. Exactly depends which narrative you're going to follow. Jonathan, we, we covered a lot of uh, of terrain. One, maybe one one last thing uh, that uh, that I'm going to ask you, and I, I don't know if you have an answer for it. One of the things that what you just said uh, makes me think about is this issue or this advice that's, that's out there, and I've given the advice: if you're looking to get into a PhD program and into a lab, try to talk with past graduates of the lab, current ones. It's always more complicated with with current ones. There's more potential for uh, <laughs> for uh, you know n not having such sound information. But are there pointed questions that you would say are go to, go to questions when you're trying to tease out a master narrative of a spot that you're considering to go do your graduate studies in? Yeah, I mean, I think that is exactly the right advice. That's certainly the advice I would give to anyone, which is talk to people who came out of that lab. You know, it's funny. I, in a way, I think the, the question to ask is, tell me the story of your graduate school experience, which is a very disarming question because it actually sounds like the most generic, non-strategic question one could ask. But I actually think that disarmingness and the, the prompt to put it in storied form allows you to then listen for, how did this story go? Do I want to be a character in that story? Um, and I, I mean, and I think I would ask 
you know, I would always ask what are the values at play in the lab here? Um, not just the mechanics of like, how many hours did you spend in the at the bench? But, um, you know, what are the values that seem to guide this particular lab? And how do those show up in your in the daily life? Like, how do those values get instantiated in the day to day life of graduate students? Um, but I think, you know, when we're collecting people's personal stories, a suite of questions that we often ask are, tell me about a high point, a low point, and a turning point. And those are pretty easy prompts for people to answer. And I would think high point, low point, and turning point would yield really useful information. So think about your PhD journey story. Give me the high level version of that. And then tell me in more depth about a high point, a low point, and a turning point. It's a, a nice triad of things easy to, to memorize. And I think people listening will, will easily be able to use that in their explorations. And I, yeah, it's, this is sound advice and uh, you, you need to try and, and, uh, and know where you're landing when you're getting into a, pro, a PhD program because of these issues. Because, you know, there are different master narratives going on. Can you live within that narrative or not? If you cannot, it can lead to a very difficult journey through graduate school. And none of us want that. We want everyone to have a good time becoming a, a researcher in, in their domain. Jonathan, we're really getting to, to the end of the interview. Uh, you were very generous in sharing your personal stories, but also your, your knowledge around this. I, I'm really, really grateful to, be, to have been able to learn a little bit in more depth about the subject of the personal narrative the the na narrative identity and uh, I, I'm I'm sure and I'm going to try to share this with the people that I that I mentor now maybe before we go uh, well one thing I'm going to ask of you is how people can reach out to you but before you share that you know for someone who is you know down in the dumps uh, third year of their PhD thinking my experiments are not working I'm probably not suited to be here. Uh, I lucked out getting into the program, but actually I'm not made to be a scientist. Do you have a, a word of encouragement based on what we said? First, I would want to just sympathize and say like, yeah, this, this sounds really hard. Um, and right, I mean, when your experiments don't work out, that sucks. And, you know, you think about the humanities or arts analog, there, there isn't an objective criterion of it doesn't work out. It means your ideas are not catching hold and people aren't resonating with them. And that feels terrible also. So a couple of pieces. One is, of course, I'd want to normalize the experience of failure. Anyone who has pursued something hard has failed along the way. And certainly in academia, you know, there's all those studies that never worked out, all those papers that never got published. That is part of how it goes. So sort of tolerating that is actually not a signal that you're um, a failure. It's a signal that you're doing something really hard. And really hard things take some failure along the way. So I would want to recast the narrative in that way. But then I would, ask, I, I would encourage people to stop and think about what was it that you wanted? How does what you're doing align with what you were hoping for? Just because your experiments are work, not working out does not mean you are not a scientist. Let's not equate you know, something that is out of your control with your identity. Lots of our experiments don't work out and science is a process, not an outcome. So learning to do the process of science is what makes you a scientist, not whether your experiments work out or not. And then, yeah, I, I would encourage people to dip into the sort of grand narrative of their lives and think about, you know, even though this is really hard right now, is, is it possible that I'm in a tough moment but that in a few years, I will look back on this and see them at this as the seeds of redemption, the beginning of a turning point. Um, and if so, then maybe it's worth it's worth tolerating and building up that muscle and the the ability to handle the the setbacks along the way. I love that you that you equated to building a muscle, and and uh, I think yeah, going through graduate school does increase our fortitude, our resilience. And I like how this kind of loops the loop to the redemption that we talked about right in the beginning. Uh, Jonathan, where can people reach out to if they want to just say hi or give feedback? Yeah, sure. You, you have my website scrolling along the bottom. It's www.jonathan-adler.com. You can go there and, and my contact information is there. Perfect. Jonathan, this was a huge, huge pleasure. It feels to me that you enjoyed kind of 
following me where I kind of brought you in this in this universe of graduate school and being a scientist or or identifying as a researcher or not. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people are are struggling with this, and I strongly believe that you've shared simple and very actionable tools for them to use in little by little changing their view on negative things that might be happening and uh, and building a healthy narrative for themselves. I think it's very important, and I, I think uh, your research is very valuable in that sense. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to another Beyond the Thesis conversation with me, David Mendez, and my guest, Jonathan Adler. This question of figuring out how graduate school fits in your life's narrative is a difficult one to talk about. There's often a lot of cognitive dissonance when having these types of conversations. So if you like this episode, if you like what I share on Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD, and you'd like me to come talk to your student group, to your department, to your program, just write an email to david at papaphd.com and I'll be glad to respond. Thank you for listening and see you on the next episode of Beyond the Thesis with Papa PhD.